love. I want to share this with you. Let's go to James really quick. James, James chapter four. We call this war and rumor of war, which is going on in the world. From whence does all this war and rumor of war come from? Right? From whence does all this war and rumor of war come from? So we're going to put this, you know, we're going to make this a little bit smaller right here. Okay, this thing is is acting a little erratically right there. So don't worry about that. Let that go through, do its thing right there. We had some windows open for a couple of days now. We was really into a study of this, a meditation of this. And then we wanted to share what we're sharing right here. So the enemy, you know, is trying through their means, you know, but we're going forward, forward ever, backward never. But from whence does wars and fighting come amongst humanity? It says, come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members, right? The lust, the coveting, the desires, right? The desires that are in our members, right? We can say in our physical members or in the members of whatever corporate body, whether in the world, right? Under the, you know, in the world or whether in the kingdom, what church, what camp you may be of, Israel, right? Where does these wars and these fightings come amongst us. But let's scroll forward. Scrolling forward is interesting because we get to verse, um, we get to verse, uh, well, this whole thing is very important. Let me just go through this right here. Verse two, we're in James four and two. It says, ye lust, ye have a desire, right? A desire which you do not have a right or a righteousness to have, you know, a desire. And, and this comes in many different forms. When the word lust is used, it should also be the word covet, right? Thou should not covet. But then people don't understand covet. They think of a corvette, right? We mean covet. That means having a desire to have something that you have no right or righteousness to have, right? You know, you know, uh, gravelicious, licky, licky, you know, like in some of the old reggae song, one of the two, like always want other people's things, right? Or that which you have no right to have. This is where the wars come. It says, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Now the word ask there means to beseech. It means to beg. Malemon, right? Lemmene, right? Ye ask, ye beseech. It doesn't mean just, uh, uh, let me ask you a question. It don't mean ask in that sense. It means to beg, to beseech. Like, they please, please, give it give it to me. Give it to me. Come on, will you please give it to me? It's that sense of begging and asking. Oh, will, will, will you please help me? Please, 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 please. You know, that sense of asking. Ye ask, right, or beg, beseech, and receive not because ye ask amiss. Now, I thought this was the key, the key here as well. Ye ask amiss. Now, what does amiss mean? When we looked into the Amharic, Right? When we looked into the, the Royal Amharic of the Mets of Kedus, the interesting thing that we found there is that the word ask, right? First of all, meant to beg, to beseech, right? The second thing we found about James chapter 4 is that the word amiss, A M I S S I, not I I I P P B I, all that the Mississippi kind of thing. No, but the miss in that sense means according to the the royal Amharic and therefore according to the Hebrew and the Septuagint, that word miss is bekufu. Now bekufu means evilly, for evil, right? For evil. Now what is evil? You see, we judge a lot of things. And remember what, what prayer is to judge? We judge a lot of things by our feelings and emotions. That means we judge a lot of things by our soul, right? But by our old soul, by our unregenerated soul, by our unrestored soul. What is the soul again? We did the whole teaching on the soul. Have you checked that out? Have you learned the truth for yourself? The soul is our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, our will, our desire, our, our mind. Right? So when we get a feeling or emotion, from whence does that come from? That's coming from our soul. That is telling us, of, of our soul. That's our soul, our inner feminine speaking, right? The soul is nefesh, and nefesh in the Hebrew, the Masoretic, the traditional, the Torah Hebrew, as well as in the Gutters, 
like the ancient Ethiopic and the Metzaf Kedus, the Book of the Seven Seals of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, that word one and the same is feminine, right? The nefs, the nefs or nefesh is feminine. That's the key. You know, you hear people talk about the, our inner femininity, our inner female, our inner feminine, but they don't tell you this is the soul. They tell you about psychology and want to psych you out slowly, right? They tell you about psychology, right? Which they say is a study of the mind. And this is what we touched on, the lost soul of psychology. And we posted that up there as well, my brothers and sisters. These are videos where we try to zoom in on a specific point, right? Right here, this is a kind of a rhema word, right? This is more like a sipket right here because we're inspired to share a couple of things right here. That even though we want to talk about something specific, the Holy Spirit wants us to lay this groundation and foundation first, right? We want to talk about Sobek. So when you see that, that's exactly what we want to speak on, right? But we're following his will and his way and his mind. And this is why we're right here in James right now. Although the main theme right here is Sukkot. We won't say, well, Sukkot, what does James chapter 4 have to do with it? Well, let's listen up. It says right here, ye ask or you beg and you don't receive. Because ye ask, you beg amiss, you beg evilly that ye may consume it. That ones may consume it upon what? That they may consume it, the scripture says, one may consume it upon their lust. Notice that right there, that one may consume it on their lust. How interesting is this, brothers and sisters? How very interesting is this, to consume it on their lust? Now, if you look at the English, you might get the idea from the words, but it's only the Holy Spirit that would really clarify right, exactly what those words really are if we had a translation Right, that was a hundred percent accurate. The King James is very close, especially for the English, for us English speakers. Right, so we are not going to slander and malign the King James, but we're not going to over exalt it either, like some people are King James only. Right, even though the Holy Spirit might be telling them they need to study the Hebrew and the Greek, they said no, 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 no. So that's their own laziness right there. Let's get a hearing of verse three right here, four and three. Miraf arad kutera sauce, mindeno, mindeno. Let's get this right here, and it says, um, it says, "Tlem nalachu be mitchoto chachu hum te." Kafulu zen be kufu telem na lachuhuna atik ebalum. Right? Atik ebalum. So one's desire certain things evilly from a negative intent, from an evil, right? A kufu intent. Now, what does evil mean? You see, we, we judge evil, good and evil, based on our own deceived soul. That inner feminine, that life in us, our soul has been deceived as Haywan, Eve, had been deceived. Our souls are deceived. This only means we were born in a world, right? We're born in this world, this seclorum of khatiyat, of the systemic anomaly, otherwise known as sin, right? Otherwise known as sin. So sometimes we're struggling with thoughts and desires and we're like, you know, we didn't go out there to find these thoughts and desires, but it's like these thoughts and desires have found us. And in our vulnerability and in our weakness and in our ignorance and our not knowing, many times we, we, we figured that, okay, we'll follow that. We'll go after that. Then after the hurt and the pain, where's that feeling, that emotion that led you there? It's like the feeling and emotion tricked you, got you in that. Now you're in the situation. You did the crime, but you don't even have, like people say, I don't know why I did that. You understand? Is that possession? Is that a sense of possession? Some people say, you don't want to take responsibility. But who is responsible? Whose God is really responsible for this world the way it is? Now, see, our Father gets blamed, right? The true God, the true power gets blamed. But the scriptures, if you would study to show yourself approved, you will recognize as the God of the world. Wait, hold up. There's a God of the world? Right? There's a God, yeah, there's a ruling archon, right, 
on, over this world and is not the God and Father, right? It's not the power and the Abba of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach. It's not. The, the word explains this, right? So when people say we all worship one God and you ignorantly say, yeah, you should do what the Israelites did to Moses, when Moses said, well, I'm going to say the God of the Hebrews. Go say the God of the Hebrews. And he says, but um, what is your name? What is your name? He always, identity. Right? What is in a name? Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Right? Hashem. Right? Blessed be the Lord God of the name. Right? This is why the name is the key. Right? This is why the name is the key. Yeshua. Yeshua means he saved, he saves, he is saving. Yahoa, right? Or Yahoshua, rather, Yahoshua, Yahushua, Yahshua means that Yah is salvation, right? That was pointing to, that's a type, right? That's the type right there, right? Let's recognize that is the type, right? That is the type. That's the shadow. Yeshua is the substance, right, of that which in the old, right, the Brit Hashana was the type and the shadow or the teaching tool. But let's move forward. Let's move forward right here. So the word says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Now, when you adulterate something, this comes from the basic English. Let's start from low degree to high degree. From the basic English, something that's adulterated, right, has been made less than what it is. You see, something that's been adulterated. And, and I know some people like uh, cafe au lait and, and, you know, cappuccino. We're, we're just using this as an example, all right? Uh, when you add milk, right, to your coffee, right? The, the, the coffee in its original sense has been adulterated. I'm just using that study as an example. Right? As examples, like you have water, right? If you have water and you add flavoring to it, in that sense, the water has been adulterated. Do you understand the idea? Right? It has been cheapened, has been devalued, right? It has been devalued in that sense, right? It's like in the old days, they would have gold and silver, maybe coins and coins of certain natural valuable metals and people would shave off an end of the coin little by little right that's a way of adulterating that currency that means that currency really if it was to be weighed that shekel it doesn't have that weight because somebody shaved off a little bit of the silver that's what adultery you're cheapening you're you're devaluing something that has a higher value now why does this concern us because we're speaking about worship all right, we're speaking about this seventh of the feast of Yahweh Eloheinu, right? Because we're speaking about this feast. The feast has to do with worship. It has to do with celebrating or honoring, right? Honoring not just the day and the time, but the one, the appointment, the Moedim. That's the Hebrew word, the Moedim, right? It's an appointment. So it says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. That means male and female, right? And see, a lot of people will look at this and think it just means sexually, right? This means because even the sexuality is an example, right? Even the idea of male and female in relationship is an example. It's a type that Yahweh even uses to teach us when he says that he has divorced our mother Israel because of her adulteries. Right? It wasn't that Israel's as nation was having sex with other nations, but was adulterating that covenant relationship. Right? Was cheaping it, cheapening it, was devaluing it. Right? So when we allow worldliness or worldly ideas to intrude, right? Or to dwell or to tabernacle, right? That defiles our dwelling, our tabernacling. Right now, not talking about a lot of y'all might be thinking about personal people, but you need to be overstanding this in spirit and in truth first. You see, because it's easy to look at the other person and say, they got a speck in their eye. I've been trying to get the speck out of their eye, right? And then you don't recognize the beam in your own eye. 
Right? And people get offended. A lot of folks have gotten offended the more and more that we preach and teach. We've noticed that some folks, they're like, yeah, you go, Rebbe. You go. Yeah, that, yes, I. You know? And then when you have to correct them, they can't receive it. Even though it's not personal, I, I love them. Right? But I hear his word, and his word says, correct that right there. And we back it up with scripture. Right? And we say, okay, if that's the wrong interpretation of the scripture... Right? Or you think that doesn't apply, right? Then then head rest with him, ask him for wisdom, ask him for his Holy Spirit, and show show me what what, what, what the right and what his righteousness in is in that word and why that does not apply. Right? But it says ye adulterers and adulteresses. This is speaking of in spirit, right? And according to the his 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 truth. Right? People say everybody got their own truth. I don't care about everybody's own truth. What is his truth? Ye adulterers, y'all adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world, of the seclorum, is enmity. That word enmity is so very, because what's enmity, right? The, the, the till and the talatinet, the enmity from the beginning. Remember the enmity between the serpent seed, right? And the seed of the woman. And that woman, who is that woman? That woman is the mother of all living. Right, which is a type of the soul. So once again, we come to soul. Yeshua is the savior. He has saved our soul. What is the soul? The soul is the psyche, the suke. So what does sukkot mean in that sense? Right? In what way are we to tabernacle? Are we to dwell? Right? Or what is or who is to be indwelling? Right? But friendship of the world. Is enmity with Ha Elohim. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world or will permit themselves to be a friend of the world is an enemy of Ha Elohim. What? what? What's being said right there? You mean we can be an enemy of Ha Elohim? You know, we all are enemies of Ha Elohim before our regeneration. And regeneration is a fancier word to say being born again before I will being born again in spirit and in truth. But what's the seed? What's the father's seed? The father's seed, right? The father's seed is his word, right? The father's seed is his word. John chapter one explains that right there. And that also connects with tabernacles. If we go to John chapter one, let's go to John chapter one for a moment. And it says right here, it says, um, but as many as received him, to them gave he power or authority to become, to become, that's a process, to become the sons, the B'nai Ha-Elohim, even to them that Amen, Amen, right, or Amen, be live on his name and be live in his name, Shemo, which were born, you get that? Verse 13, which were what? Born, right? Born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of Ha Elohim. You got to meditate on that right there. Because there's a birth here, but it's not according to blood. Oh, this is my ancestor. It's not according to blood, right? It's not according to the will of the flesh, nor according to the will of a man or man. But it's of Ha Elohim. But let's go a little bit further to explain the seed. What is the seed? Verse 14. Speaking about the incarnation. The being incarnals. People talk about reincarnation. What kind of stuff are you talking about? Re? You mean again? You have, you have not even incarnated yet. Allowed his word to dwell in you. So his word dwelling in us. Right? Becomes a seed of our rebirth, of our regeneration. And it's only in the regeneration can we follow, this is according to his word, can we follow the son of man? To follow the son of man in his regeneration, right? In his regeneration, not in our kind of ideas, whatever they may be, which are not according to his seed. See, if we have ideas that are not according to his seed, that is considered, and that is adulteration, right? That is the process known as adulteration. 
right? And the charge of that is adultery. And if you are adulterating the teaching of his majesty in your head, your heart, and amongst others, then you are an adulterer, right? Or an adulteress. Non-partial right there. Because if we look at number six, it speaks about when either male or female, when we speak about the Nazarite, that Nazarite vow to be separate, to, to be caduced, to be set apart, right? Set apart from what? Set apart from the world and the worldly, the preoccupation with satisfying the world flesh and devil ideas out there or pleasing people, right? Or not recognizing that that rebirth, right? That rebirth takes us out of our former entanglements, right? Our former relationships, right? Doesn't mean that we don't relate to these people, right? But now we have become children of Yeshua's father has become our father, right? His power has become our power. In Matthew chapter 19, Verses 28 to 29, it reads this. It said, He says, Amen, I say to you. If you look at that in the Hebrew, Amen, I say to you. Verily is Amen, verily, veritas, truth. Aman, Amen, truth. Right? Going to the good is and the and the and, and the Hebraic. Amen, I say to you that ye y'all who have followed me, who have followed I, Yeshua HaMoshe is speaking right here. In the regeneration, that means in the being born again, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones. Doing what? Judging, right? Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, remember the key link with that word judging and prayer and tepillah and pelal. Right? As well. Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Make an intercession for the 12 tribes of Israel. Praying for the ingathering of the 12 tribes of Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. The black sheep of the family. And every one that hath left houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or children, or lands, for my, what? My name's sake. You see how the name is coming in? The Shem, blessed be the Lord God of the Shem, right? So we're not speaking of the blood, or the flesh, or the will of man. We're speaking of Ha Elohim Baruch Hu, right? So everyone that have left houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake shall do what? Receive, Kabbalah, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit eternal life. Amen. Amen. If you receive that word, say, Amen. I, I admit, right? Let it be, right? So be it. And the word was made flesh. John chapter one, verse 14, speaking about the incarnation. That the being incarnated, right? The dwelling in flesh, right? And we're speaking about Sukkot here, right? Sukkot, and this is the first day. This is the seventh, right? This is the seventh, you know, seven heaven. This is the seventh. This is the fulfillment. This is the fullness, right? We're speaking of this time, Right, this divine time for our heart and mind, or the festival of Sukkot, which is the feast of tabernacles, is also mentioned as in gathering, right? In gathering, and we learn that the feast of tabernacles is likened to Adoni's supper, what's what's often called the Last Supper, or Adoni's Eucharist, the supper, right, for the church. For those who have been ekaliod or called out. The church is the called out ones, both memorial as well as prophetic. So we see the duality, the two truths. It's both memorial and it's prophetic. It's both in spirit and it's in truth. It's memorial as to the redemption 
right, of the Beta Israel out of Gibbet, out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, out of spiritual bondage, and it's prophetic as to the Malkut Shabbat. It's prophetic as to the kingdom rest of Israel. Ze Israel after her regathering. Notice Israel is considered a she, her, soul, right? The soul people, right? After her regathering and restoration and being restored, right? Restored. See, you see, we've been in a, 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 a 400 plus years of bankruptcy, right? Of bankruptcy. And from that bankruptcy comes the corruption, right? Now the regeneration undoes, undoes the corruption, but it begins with the seed, it begins with the word, it begins with the indwelling, it begins with tabernacles. When the feast again becomes memorial, not for Israel, not just for we as the once lost but now found black sheep of the Beta Israel alone, but for all nations. Right? For all nations, for, for the Goyim, for all nations, according to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 to 21. Right? 16 to 21. And we share this right here so that ones will understand the typology, even the typology that has been symbolized right here. Right? Even this typology, right? Of Adonai's Supper. Right? of Black Christ Passover, the Fasica, the Lord's Supper, right? You know, that indwelling where they dwelt in the upper room, right? Where they dwelt in the upper room. But the key thing is that his word dwelling in us, right? His word dwelling in us, right? This, this is the fullness. What is the fullness of Sukkot? How do we observe Right? How do we observe Sukkot here being in the land of our captivity, being in a land that's not our own? Remember the Israelites? The Israelites were called to come out. And Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go. But initially, he was like, we, we need to go to worship our God. Right? And Pharaoh said, well, compromise. Let's compromise. You can worship your God right here. You know what I mean? And 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 Moses said, no, no, that's that'll be abomination, right? To your people, to the Egyptians. If we worship God, if we worship our Abba Father, right, in the land of captivity, the way we are supposed to, that would be an abomination to the Babylonians. Because we're still in that land of captivity. This is preparing us for the Exodus movement of Yah's people, the coming out. So what does Sukkot mean to us? How do we observe it? Can we keep it? Mm -hmm. Do we keep it according to the old right covenant? But we keep it according to the old covenant. That would prove that we are not in the new covenant. <laughs> is that a true word, Sal? This is why verse 14 of John says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us now see that idea among us right in the regeneration must be the word dwells in us right the word dwells in us right is the indwelling the indwelling right the meditating on his word right because his word is living right his word we're not talking about the dead letters the, or the literal like just on the page but we're talking about eating this word in our spirit Right, because um, um, it, it, you know the 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 letter of the law, right? The letter is dead, but it's the spirit that gives life, right? And Adoni is the spirit, right? The Lord is the spirit, right? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, amongst I and I, and we beheld His glory. Highlight that part there about we beheld His glory. And then also note, for my part, I glory in the Bible. So what are we to behold? The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, of the Ab, full of grace and truth. That's what Sukkot is all about. That's what in gathering. 
That's what tabernacling is all about, right? That is the real reason, right, for this season that we know as Sukkot, right? Sukkot, right? Now, let's go forward once again with James, right? With James, right? Verse 5, 4 and 5. So it says, do you think that the scripture saith in vain? The spirit that dwelleth, right? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, right? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. So let's ask ourselves, well, what does this mean? What does it mean that the spirit that dwells in us, it lusteth to do what? To envy. What is envy, right? So here I want to go to... um. I want to go to the Recovery Bible, right? The Recovery Bible, right? And in the Recovery Bible, right? In the Recovery Bible, it says right here, the footnote says that when Elohim, and this is from Watchman uh, Lee's, I mean, Witness Lee's notes right here, when Elohim acquired us to be his spouse. Uh-oh, we've been acquired to be what? This is speaking of the marriage of the Lamb. Right? It's speaking of the marriage of the Lamb. Let's bring let's bring this symbology right here too, as well. Right? So we're speaking of the marriage of the Lamb. Right? This is speaking of the marriage of the Lamb. Let's see if we can move this down right here. Right? Move this down right here. And cover up that Roman right there. And let's move the tabernacle right here. Right? And that verse, that revelation verse. Right, that was shown to us, right? That was shown to us to share with you from um share with you from um Isaiah one and eight, the cottage. That word cottage is actually a sukkah, right? It's actually a hut. And it's speaking about how the daughter of the daughter of of Zion has been left and also is besieged, right? So many of us we feel besieged. Our soul is besieged by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our world may be besieged, right, by by our houses, our brethren, right, speaking of our brothers of the flesh, our sisters of the flesh, our fathers of the flesh, our mothers of the flesh, even our children of the flesh, even the lands of the flesh, right? But, but for his sake, right, for his sake, he says to leave them. Now, how do we first begin to leave in spirit and in truth? There has to be that separation. We, we still love them. But we love them for his sake because he has first loved us and he gives us very specific commands to be at peace as much as is possible with all people, according to him, in his will, in his spirit, in his truth. So he's acquired us as to be his spouse. He put his spirit into us to make us one, a hadu, with him, right? First Corinthians 6 and 19 and... 1 Corinthians uh, 16 to 17. He is a jealous or a zealous Elohim, according to Exodus 20 and 5, according to the Decalogue, right? The, the, the commandment, not 10 commandments, it's 10 words. The 10 words equal one commandment. And his spirit is jealous or zealous over I and I with the jealousy or the zealousy of Ha Elohim. 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. He longs for us. So he is longing for us because we belong to him. All right? We belong to him. That's why he longs for us. He's jealously desiring right? our best, our good, our bless. That I and I make not friends with his enemy. He doesn't want us to make friends with his enemy. The world, the flesh, and the devil are those who's the world's seed is dwelling in them, right? The world's ways are dwelling in them, not to make friends with his enemy and be his lover at the same time. So you see that double-minded, that duality, right? That double-minded, that duality right there. It says, this is the only time that Yaakov, who is James, mentions Elohim's indwelling spirit. Or the Tawahedo, Tawahedo, the becoming one, right? The true faith, the faith that was once delivered, 
right, to the saints that was once given to those who set themselves apart for that faith and became the Kedusan, the Kedoshim, the saints of Yahweh Elohim, Beshem Yeshua, HaMushiach, right? And it was from the negative side in concerning the abolishing of the friendship of the world. That means we have acquaintance with ones in the world, but not a friendship. We can't be unequally yoked, right? Because then the seed, the word becomes choked. If we are unequally yoked, right? If we're unequally yoked with worldly brethren, with worldly sistren, with worldly fathers and mothers. I'm talking about those of the flesh. That's what Yeshua is speaking of initially. We're not speaking of our brethren in the spirit and in the truth because they're our brethren in spirit and in truth and they are not in friendship with the world or the ways of the world, right? Not from the positive side concerning the building up of the body of Christ. So what James is saying right here in James is from the negative side, right? He's, he's saying it's a negative command. Right? We have positive commands and negative commandments. This is a negative commandment that's saying, cut it off. <laughs> cut it. Right? Let's cut that out. Right? And we begin from our spirit and our soul. You see, we begin in the, in, by, by, by being uh, transformed by the renewing of our mind. So this is happening within us. You see, some people, they'll say, oh, I'm going to get away from this person or that person physically. So it's like, taking somebody physically out of a situation, but not taking the root, which is dwelling in them, out. So in other words, it's like you could take, you know, you could take the nigga out of Babylon, but you can't take Babylon out of the nigga, right? So first thing we have to do is take Babylon out of us, out of our heart and our mind. And this is growing in grace, growing in the word of truth, right? Dwelling in the word, dwelling in, in the meditating on his word and the learning of his word, learning of his love, right? It's like a love letter. The scriptures, the Bible is like a love letter, right? Between the beloved and his love interests. And this is speaking of us individually, each of us individually, and then the corporate body as the church of the firstborn. Now, the second part of this verse five, it says, what, well, make his home, right? Make his home. Let's read the verse according to uh, Witness Lee's um, Recovery Bible. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us longs to envy, right? Longs to envy that he's caused to dwell. The key part, dwell. Here is tabernacle, and tabernacle is make a home, right? To make his home, allow his word, right? In spirit and in truth to make his home in our hearts and our mind. This is the whole reason for the season, for this appointed season, for this appointed time, right? It's not just the outer building of a booth the physical building of a booth. That was the shadow. That was the type. The true substance is to make his home, right? Allow him to make his home, right? Within your heart and your mind. That the indwelling spirit, that the ruach that dwells within us, that tabernacles within us, makes his home in us, make his home in I and I, that he may occupy our entire being, right? That we will be total, or as Rastafari say, as I and I say, this is ital. Ital is vital, to be entire, to be complete, to be whole, right? In that sense of being whole is to be holy, to be set apart, right? And this is the process of how and why this time is so significant, seeing that this is October 8th, the blood moon sign, right? The blood moon, the second of the four blood moons. And we've touched on that significance of the blood moon and what the prophetic word says in Joel and elsewhere in the scripture. But let's go forward right here, 
right? So the indwelling spirit, right? His indwelling spirit, right? We must allow, invite to make his home in us, in our hearts and in our minds that he may occupy our entire being. And you can compare this with what is said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. For Elohim, right? For our power, the true power, our source, our God, if you please, causing I and I to be holy, causes us to be holy, completely for our husband, right? For our husband. Who is our husband? Right? See, we're speaking spiritually. Some people can get confused because they are still dwelling physicality, right? And see, the sisters might be able to get this a little bit easier than some of us brothers because we'd be like, he's our husband, right? But see, if we allow him to be our husband in spirit and in truth, know this, we become better husbands in spirit and in truth and produce good fruit. You see, if we allow, we must learn from his example. As it says, it says, it says to the husbands to love your wives, right? For us to love our wives as Christos, as Christ, so love the church. And he did what? He gave himself, right? He gave himself for the church, right? That's beautiful right there. You know, when I first read this, I was like, okay. You know, I kind of read it like a lot of us as brethren read it, right? But now that I grow more in it, it's like, this is the truth. And and, and, and that shows how, how off we are because we'll read it at first. You know, those parts of the scripture we read and we don't really fully understand it, but the reading, the translation sounds nice and everything, you know, sounds good. Right. But then as we grow. Right. And then hopefully if we grow. Right. We begin to recognize the real, the 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 the, the, the so-called deeper meaning. Right. That, you know, that deeper meaning, that real meaning. And it's like, wow, I didn't see this before. That shows how blind we were, and but also how good he is. Right. That kind of shows that we are growing when we can then perceive. Oh, wow. We, we can see it holistically. Right. Fully. That, because it, it says no scriptures of a private interpretation. Like like scripture must be compared with scripture. Right. This is why we'll touch on this scripture here and then we'll go forward to this scripture here. So let's go forward to this scripture right here. Now that we have a better understanding of James four and five, four and six says, but he giveth what? More grace. Remember? Grace and in truth. John chapter 1. And the word, the logos, the devar was made flesh, was made flesh and dwelt amongst us to be that example of his word, right? Of Yeshua's testimony dwelling in us, right? Tabernacling in us and transforming us right, from the low degree that he found us into the high degree of his glory, and we beheld his glory, we behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As I've taught before, because the Spirit has taught I this, that grace and truth are not two different principles, they're basically two sides of the same coin, right? They're basically two sides of the same coin. In other words, you can't have one without the other, right? You cannot have one without the other. Hence, Satan, right? Cursed be he, the enemy, right? The God of the world, he fell from grace, right? He fell from grace. Why? Because of a lack of the truth. Right? Because of a lack, a lie against the truth. Right? A, not against your truth. Because you see, a lot of us will focus it on ourselves, and that's the God delusion. We have to come off and come out of that God delusion. I call it that goddamn delusion. Right? Where we are exalting ourselves, 
And that's the spirit of Satan right there. We have to humble ourselves. We have to see his finger pointing at us. And we have to clear ourselves in spirit and in truth because then we can receive the more grace that he giveth. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, Elohim resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. He resisteth the proud, but he giveth what? He giveth grace to the humble. So here in the word it says right here, and here's what's the key right here. Um, he, he opposes those proud ones led to Hutan, to the Tehutan, right? To the humble ones led to Hutan again. Sagan Yiset Al Yilal, right? He giveth grace, right? He giveth grace. He giveth more grace, but he resisteth the proud. Why right? Satan fell? Why? How does Satan fall from grace? Because of pride. But he giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to Egeziah, he helps to the sustainer. Resist or oppose Diablos, and he will flee from you. Here's the verse I wanted to get to, brothers and sisters, verse 8. Draw nigh, draw near to Elohim, to the source, to the power. And how do we draw near to him? Through his word, in spirit and in truth. And he will draw near, draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Ye sinners. Because the work of our hands that make us sinners. Overstand. And purify your hearts. What? Ye double-minded. I think that's so interesting because double-minded actually means double-hearted, right? Because the word heart in the Hebrew refers to the mind. So when it is said double-minded, originally meant, according to its ancient type, to be double-hearted or even, in a sense, to be double-souled, right? That's the yay and nay. That's the yay and nay, right? The iffy-wiffy, you know, the fickle. My yes and no, and yes and no about his things, the things concerning him, first and foremost. My, this is touching on the first principles of the word of God. You see, people read that in Hebrew and says, well, let's moving past the first principles of the oracles of God. Well, if you never knew the first principles, how can you move past something you never knew? See, we have to learn these things. This what it says, be afflicted. See, verse 9 is a good verse for the first part or the previous portion of this season, speaking about Yom Kippur and the 10 days of awe and the time of Teshuva, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Verse 9, verse 10, humble yourselves in whose sight? The sight of Adonai. You see, a lot of us, we will humble ourselves in people's sight. So people will do holy, holy, moly, moly things in the sight of people. Almost like what it says when fasting, remember when Yeshua spoke about fasting and he said, you disfigure your faces. He says, rather he taught us the disciples, that's not what we should do because it's in his sight, right? In his sight, we should humble ourselves, right? And he will lift us up. So we don't have to be lifted up in pride. He will lift, the, lift us up. Verse 11 says, speak not evil one of another, brethren, and in his spirit, I'm going to extend this to the sisters. Speak not evil one of another. Mm -hmm. When we've heard and listened, you know, in this ministry, in this service, this is what happens to the evil that one speak, right, of one another. And it's not just personal. Many times they're speaking evil because they're not speaking the good word. They're not speaking the true word, the good word that helps us to oppose and resist Diablos. See, Diablos is a liar. But many of us, we be lying against his goodness because we get in some situation, but we are unstable and unlearned in the word. So we're going to have a knee-jerk reaction and start to sound like the world, right? And start to respond like the world. That is having friendship with the world, right? That is friendship with the world. It says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, right? His brother in the spirit. His brother in 
the law, his brother-in-law, the spirit of the of the, the, the law of Yeshua HaMoshiach. Let me get this verse here because I want to... I want to quote this in the way that most people will be able to receive in the English right here. Let's go to Romans chapter 9 to show you Yeshua's Torah. Because some say we're not dealing with the Torah anymore. They lie. Where's your tongue? They don't know what they're talking about. Verse 8 says, Romans chapter 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them. You remember judging ourselves? Acquit or he has acquitted us. Even though our acts have condemned us, we receive his word, his spirit, his life, and that acquits us. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in HaMoshiach, Yeshua, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse 2 is where the new Torah, the new Torah of the spirit, it delivers, and this is what makes us righteous. Not righteous according to our feelings and emotion, but righteous in his spirit and according to his truth. Right? So if you want to feel righteous, that might not happen. And a lot of folks, they fall off because they don't feel righteous. That's not where it begins from first. It begins in spirit. You see, as we receive his word, it strengthens our spirit. As our spirit is strengthened with his word, then our soul is transformed. Our soul is restored. Our soul is renewed. Our soul is like that new Jerusalem, like that bride that is prepared, right? That bride that is prepared for the law, the Torah of the spirit, the Ruach of life, the spirit of life in HaMoshiach. Yeshua in Christos, Jesus in the anointed, he saves, hath made me, hath made I free from the Torah of sin and death. So what's he talking about there? He is, Paul is clearly giving a delineation between the old covenant and the new covenant. So when we're looking at these feasts and the festivals of Yahweh, we have to begin to understand that there's a difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. But that does not mean that the old covenant is unholy or has no value. It, does, it has great value. It has, it, 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 it's, it's the key, it's the foundation, it's the groundation. Right? And without that groundation, we truly don't have a leg to stand on. Right? And we're not standing on the rock. Right? Because it says that for what the law, speaking about the law of sin and death, it's not speaking about the law of the spirit of life in Christos, the Jesus, the Moshiach, Yeshua. Because it says, for the Torah, if you were to read this in Hebrew, and we have this in Hebrew, and hopefully we'll get a chance to read this in Hebrew and show you how the law, when you find law, in the scriptures, the majority of times, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, refers to the word Torah. But then a careful and a judicious study, right, of the scriptures will clearly um, reveal to you that there is the Torah of Moses, which provides us that context, right, provides us that orientation, Right? And, and then the revelation, the fullness, but there's a veil. It is veiled. That's why when they read the Old Testament, there's a veil over their eyes because they don't receive the Son in spirit and in truth according to the Word and the will of the Father. But see, a lot of times we want everything to so-called make sense to us. You know, I, I mean, that right there is a kind of an arrogant pride in a sense. It got to so-called make sense to us. Right? You know what I mean? It doesn't make sense to me why one day is going to be so sunny and bright and the next day is cloudy. I want every day to be sunny. So therefore, because every day is not sunny, we're going to act like we don't comprehend the reality of the fact that this is weather pattern and so forth and so on and give thanks, whether it's sunny or whether it's cloudy. You see what I'm saying? Yovas? So it says right here, for the law, the Torah of the spirit of life. So there's a Torah. There is the Torah of the spirit, the ruach, of ha -chayim, of the life, right? In ha -moshia, in the anointed Yeshua, he saves, 
that has made I and I have made us free. But when you read this, really emphasize this part to yourself. When you read this to yourself and you meditate for the Torah of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has made I free, has made I free from the Torah of sin and death. Verse three, for what the Torah of sin and death, that is, could not do in that it was weak. You see what I'm saying? The new covenant is strong. The old covenant was weak, right? For what the Torah could not do in that it was weak through the what? Through the flesh. Mm -hmm. Because it depended on the man that doeth these things. So if the man that doeth these things did not do these things, then that Torah was weak, right? It was weak because it could not be fulfilled. Well, let's read the word. For what the Torah could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, Elohim, our Abba Avinu Sheba Shemayim, sending his own son, his own bane, in the likeness of sinful flesh. So why do you think we say that we know Yeshua is black? Right? Who is more sinful? Right? Who has fallen more short, right, based on the intention of the Father, than we as the black man, right? We as the black man. So that sinful flesh is our own black Ethiopian flesh, his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for Hatiyat, the systemic anomaly of this worldly matrix, he condemned sin, Hatiyat, in the flesh, that the righteousness, the tzidik, of the Torah might be fulfilled in us. In I and I and I and we. Who, this is the conditional key, who, speaking of I and I, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, right? But after the spirit and after and according to his spirit, right? And according to his way, truth, and life. Yovas, this is the key for Sukkot. You understand? Because one say, well, are we supposed to build booths? And all those physical outer things, that'll be wonderful. We can do, do those things, right? In our own land. And there will be a time that we will do those things. But this is the innermost of the inner that we need to get in our inner sense. So that before him and before his throne, we will be in his innocence. And we will be innocent of the judgment, the last judgment of the world, the flesh and diablos. Amen. Amen. So let's go forward right here. James, right? James, a little bit more in James. So when James 11 says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, that means condemn. You condemn your brother. You condemn your sister, right? You speak evil of Torah, and you are condemning Torah. But if thou judge the Torah, thou art not a doer of the Torah, but a judge. And there is, there is one lawgiver, who is able to save and to destroy, who art thou that judgeth another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go to such a, such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. That's one that's talking about, they're doing their own works. They're doing their own thing. Are you serving him? Right? You see, in serving him, we're serving one another according to his way, in order, because he's not the author of chaos and confusion. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? For what is your life? It is even a vapor, like a puff of breath that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, we ought to say, if Adoni will, if Ja will, I and I shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. To rejoice in our boastings. If we joy, we joy in what he has done. We joy in his word, right? We re rejoice in his word. 
right? That's why it ends right here. It says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is khatiyat, it is sin. But you see, here's where many of us, right? The majority of us, right? Are free from that because we didn't know before. But now that we are learning, now that we are growing, now that we are knowing, that's why James says rightly here to him that knoweth to do good, do good, do good. We say the I have dingy drums, right? To do good, right? To do good, right? But it's not just to play the drums, right? That, that is also a type, a shadow. What is the substance, right? Because it's the heartbeat, right? It's the heartbeat. But some have a double heart, right? So the beat is off. Right? The beat is off. The rhythm is off. Right? It says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is chatiyat. That's why Paul says that, yes, he did these things, but he did these things in ignorance, not knowing. Like many of us have done a lot of things in ignorance and not knowing. Right? He is the atonement. Right? Father had provided his own lamb. Right? He is our atonement. He is the Father's Lamb that's acceptable. We hear ye Him. We hear Him, right? And now we come to this time of indwelling, ingathering, which is a type of Adoni's Supper. It's a type of the Supper. Now, why is it a type of the Supper, right? Michael, we are supping with Him. We are dwelling with Him. We, and where were they dwelling? Where was the Supper dwelling? The supper dwelling was in the upper room, right? So in since man is a likeness of that tabernacle, the tabernacle really is a likeness of man, and he is that perfect tabernacle, it's in our mind. Not to be conformed to the world, but to be ye transformed by the renewing, the making new of our mind. The renewing, and we renew his word to our mind. We feed on this word, but especially at a time like this, at a season like this, especially at a time and a season like this, where he is even showing and demonstrating his heavenly signs. So as we move from Yom Kippur to ingathering, right, to tabernacling, it's so important. Right? It's so important that we begin to overstand, really understand. Let's begin with understand. Because the overstanding is, is we can't get to the top of the mountain until we begin at the base. And it's very interesting because there's a whole mountain connection to this with Moses as well. And once again, I would recommend um, Hebrew for Christians, the festival of Sukkot, right? The Feast of Tabernacles is a very, very good read, right? A very good read and study and feeding. And here it goes right here, right? The Feast of Sukkot, right? Check this out right here. I want to bring some of this to you. But the Holy Spirit gave me gave me that this revelation right here. And I hope and pray that his spirit and his wisdom, you know, reveals to you Right, that which you are able to receive and feed on in spirit and in truth, and have a beautiful, right, and a blessed tabernacling with our Black Lord and Savior, with Yeshua HaMoshiach, in spirit and in truth. And may you behold His glory, because this is how we are transformed. Right? This is how he changes us. Right? This is how we overcome all of that past, all those past, all, all that past, all, all, all that which is past has passed away. Right? And we can look forward. Right? We can look forward with, with confident expectation of good. Right? A confident expectation of his word being fulfilled in and through us. So let us abide in his word and let his word abide in us richly. Shalom Rastafari. This is Wendem Yadon of the line of the tribe of Judah Society. And may Yeshua HaMoshiach to the glory of his majesty 
approve of this message. Amen. Amen.